So thank you very much. I'm going to talk for 15 minutes about designing for impact. And the, the message I'm going to bring you is actually a very simple one, which is that design is at an inflection point now where uh, the design community is beginning to think very hard and act on the idea that they can use design, particularly digital design, to create real world change about some of the social issues that really matter to us. So design has moved center stage in business uh, really in the last 10 years. Uh, and we're seeing now design being taken very seriously at the sea level right the way across the board in, in almost every market that we work in. And we're in 18 cities now. We're 600 people. I can remember eight years ago, seven, seven or eight years ago, uh, one client, when we were talking about doing some mobile design for them, and they said, well, presumably, this will be cheaper than the web work you do. And I said, well, why would that be? And they said, well, you're designing for a smaller screen, so you've got less work to do. We don't hear clients saying outrageous things like that anymore. So design really has become part of the zeitgeist in, in, in big organizations. And the question we're now beginning to tackle is, and we're continuing, obviously, to do the commercial work, but can design do so for society as well? And um, can we take the methods and approaches that we've been honing over the last eight to 10 years, particularly in service design, and apply them to some really bigger, bigger impact issues beyond uh, borders and beyond the borders and boundaries of organizations. And what's happened has been, and I actually sat on a train six months ago jotting down some of the things we were doing worldwide, and I was surprised by the number of things we were doing which were beginning to create social impact. We're working with the Veterans Association in the US. We're working with um, coconut farmers in the Solomon Islands. And um, we're literally using service design to help them re-understand how they can go about what they do and about their financial needs. We're working uh, in the slums of Mumbai on a child development project which has been pioneered in Turkey, which is about developing children's education and developing an understanding of how they're developing and developing a digital alert system so that we know when a child is falling behind what should be a smooth, certainly in the West, a smooth developmental educational path. So this is a lot of activity, but it goes beyond that. And really, to the heart of this is what we call living services. We believe that we're now entering the third era of digital. The first era was the desktop web. That started, what, 93, 94, 95, depending on your point of view, whether you were there at the time or not. We then had mobile, which I suppose you have to say kicked off with the iPhone uh, ten, eight years ago. Um, and we're still in the middle of the mobile era. Make no mistake, it's not over yet. But then now adding complexity on top of that, we have this era that we call living services, which is about to happen. And you may remonstrate and say, do you really mean Internet of Things? I don't mean Internet of Things. It is enabled by the Internet of Things. But Internet of Things is, if you like, too technical and hardware a language. This is more about connectivity. It's more than about hard, solid objects. It's about the services that flow through these things. My watch is nothing if it isn't for the services that flow through it. Frankly, I might as well stick with the analog watch I had before. So this is about the living services that will flow through things. And that, that is going to enable a wave of transformation. In 1999, some of you may have read or seen a book by Pine and Gilmore called The Experience Economy. And what they described in that was a pyramid, at the bottom of which were commodities, if you like, coffee beans. If you go up one layer of value, you have products and brand. Let's call that a cup of instant coffee or Nescafe. So that's a little bit more value. There's less of them, but there's more value you get when you sell it. The next level up, there's service. And service is, for instance, what you get when you get served a cup of coffee and you pay for it. So again, somebody's added a little bit of value. You pay more for it. There's less cups of coffee than there are coffee beans in the world. The next level up, and this is the clever bit, the next level up, they said, is experience. And people will pay for great experiences. Remember, this is back in 99. I know this is familiar territory to us now, but back then, it was fairly revolutionary. And what they said, of course, cleverly was, the internet is going to enable a lot more experiences, so we're going to see a lot more companies moving into the experience part of the pyramid and competing actively in that zone. Then they said something really clever. I think most authors would have stopped there. But they said right at the top of the pyramid is something called transformation. And that is the top level of value. If you can change people's lives in a small or a big way, then you are creating the maximum value possible. But it is also the rarest thing you can do. And it's above and beyond pure experience. And that, I believe, is where we're going with living services, with sensors, 
with ubiquitous connectivity, with the cloud, uh, and with the internet, building on top of mobile as a remote control and beyond, we're now actually entering an era where all of these things put together give us this extraordinary opportunity to create way more transformational things. And this speaks uh, very much to how do we create impact. So I'm going to highlight three ways in which we particularly believe we can create impact for incredible design work. These are all about a shift in three things. The first is the way we work. So we've spent, and at times painfully, a lot of the last 10 to 12 years espousing the cause of service design. And, and for those of you who are now familiar with that term, let me tell you, 10 years ago, there were many people who simply laughed when we talked about it or didn't understand. And it took years, not just Fjord, many people who believe passionately in service design have been working on this. But service design is about to evolve. In fact, it's evolving right now. And it will evolve into what we call living design. And living design will be different. It will use many of the techniques of service design, but we will be creating artifacts that change in real time around us. And if you stop and pause and think about that statement for a moment, it's a very big change indeed. We'll be using data and contextual information and content to change what we see and do in real time around us. This is a very, very big design challenge, and we're only just beginning to get onto it now. But that is the first of the impact changes. The second one is the belief that we will change the way in which we measure our work. And the way we do it at the moment is we largely measure scale. We talk about number of people we reach or number of eyeballs in marketing. But actually, we believe that what we're now seeing is a shift to measuring impact. And measuring impact turns out to be not that difficult conceptually after all. It's certainly not as difficult conceptually as, as living design. Measuring impact means, for example, looking at the work we do and understanding how have, we, how have we helped people's lives? To coin a phrase, that some, well, to pick a phrase somebody coined recently, how have we taken things off the thinking list and freed up our brains for different kinds of cognitive activity? That's impact. How have we actually saved lives? We've done work, for example, with Harvard Medical School on a pediatric growth chart, which explains the complicated issue of how your baby is developing to parents in a way that they understand previously Pediatricians were largely unable to talk with parents in the language they understood. This work explains through data what's happening to your child. And when we presented this to Harvard Medical School, their first feedback to us was, this work will actually save lives. And I think that was a trigger point for me, was thinking, well, what other stuff are we doing which actually can be writ large here, removing irritations from life, saving people hours, and how much value does that add up to for the world economy? So I don't believe this is difficult to do. I think it is the next generation of measurement. The third shift that we will see is a way in which we find work. And, and of the three, probably this is, to some extent, the, the, biggest, the biggest challenge. We'll get there with living design. This one, I think, is going to take uh, more work and more alliances. So at the moment, largely what most designers do, whether they're working in a startup or they're working in a big corporation or they're working at a design consultancy like Fjord, is that they react to design projects that come to them. Admittedly, they often change their shape. We spend a lot of time changing the shape of the work that's brought to us. But we don't actually go out and hunt for design projects. So we're talking now about design hunting. So how does design hunting work? Well, if you think about what happens to us largely, there is a, what we call a problem triangle. And, and I mean, this is pretty obvious. But nonetheless, we don't talk about it very often. The person who has the problem is very rarely the person who's able to fund solving the problem. And neither of them are the people who are actually able to solve the problem. So you have this complicated set which we have to resolve. And we see a, a mission for where we're going is to begin to resolve that issue. And that is the key. If we can resolve this issue, and we can do living design, and we can measure impact, then we can begin to find our way to creating a lot more impact in the market. So how do we seize the problem triangle? I'm going to show you a video of some work we've been doing in Stockholm, which I think begins to point the direction. My name is Jonas Höglund. I'm Service Design Director here at Fjord Stockholm. In 2007, at the age of five, my son Max was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Ever since, me and my wife had to have total control over Max to understand everything about Max's daily activities. 
Being a patient of uh, type 1 diabetes means that you don't have insulin in your body anymore, but instead you have to submit it. But to know how much insulin to submit, you need to know all the variables around you. What, what he's doing, what he's eating, how he's sleeping, and so on. Diabetes is a global epidemic. Today, there is 387 million people diagnosed with diabetes. That number is expected to rise to 592 million people by the year 2030. That is more than 50% increase in less than 15 years. The yearly global cost related to diabetes is 612 billion US dollars. That means that in US, one out of every ninth dollar spent on healthcare is spent on diabetes. But it should not have to be like that. Today we're leaving all these digital footprints behind us. We're carrying around the phones with us, we have activity bands. All that data could be put to use to see patterns in the data. And we could do that on an individual level, but we could also do it on a community, on a group level. Fjord Fido will enable to predict from those patterns for the future. The system will provide insulin intake recommendations based on different parameters. The most important thing is to create sort of a system that will digest all that data and provide the most relevant data for the users for them to be able to make the right decision at the right time. We started to find the right parameters or patterns that we want to use for the service. Once you know what problem you're trying to solve, you have to understand the context that that problem exists in and ask all the contextual questions that you need to answer in order to get an understanding of the context. For example, when uh, Max is taking the bike to school, and this is something that we predict throughout reoccurring patterns, we will get a better and more accurate prediction of the need for insulin intake, which is the main purpose of Fido. So for example, taking a breakfast scenario, the system could suggest that you would take less insulin than normal due to predicted activities that you have a planned gym class that day, that you didn't sleep the way you usually sleep, or a prediction of you taking the bike to school. It's going to have a huge impact on people's lives as a living service because it will adapt and change and not only improve one person's life with diabetes, but include uh, improving the life of their families, their friends. Why we started this project is this would have an enormous impact on Max's life. The promise actually to give Max his life back and give him the control. As a company, there is great business potential in bringing this to the market. And not just for diabetes, but as a living service platform for better self-treatment. So a couple of things about that video. I, um, Jonas is a bit of a hero to me because he unilaterally made this happen. He just stood up and made it happen. Now he's powerfully motivated because his son is type 1 diabetes but he's really designed for impact there. The second thing about the video is nothing you saw in the video is undoable now. It can all be done. You know, anything we invent, anything we want to invent, we believe can more or less be done now. That's the era we're in. So on the one hand, you have this extraordinary range of opportunity available to us to solve problems. On the other hand, I think we are entering an era of unparalleled challenge. And, and I, I find it, it resonated heavily just sitting through there a moment ago on a different stage, listening to a different stage, where Mike Butcher of TechCrunch was with a bunch of people discussing the range of um, initiatives being started right the way across Europe by the digital community to help with the immigrant crisis. Now, I think that's interesting because the immigrant crisis has clearly, quite literally, crossed borders. No single government is able to deal with it. What can happen is that bands of citizens can get together to begin to try to solve these problems, which are happening across border, which it begins to look like our governments don't have the taste or, or desire, or sometimes just the sheer ability to tackle. And the diabetes one is central to this, because we're getting older and fatter unstoppably in almost every society in the world. Digital gives us an opportunity to begin to bridge that and provide the health care, which we believe we should have, that we know is out there, but we actually can't afford. But to do that, we're going to have to shift from 
what is fundamentally at the moment, people call it a healthcare industry, it's not, it's an illness industry. We have to move from that to a wellness industry. And that is a significant change. And I believe that design and digital and the sort of people in this room can do that. Welcome to the age of living services and welcome to the age of designing for impact. Thank you very much. Thank you.